All right, I'm going to do a fly that is a little bit new to me. Um, I've always known of it, but I've never really used it much, called the blowtorch. Uh, it's, I mean, it's fairly popular. It's somewhat well-known. Uh, at the end of the day, that's pretty much what we're going to end up with. There's a couple of things that I do that are a little different on this fly that I kind of want to show you. And I've, uh, I've been using it quite a bit after this summer. I took a trip on the Delaware uh, here in the southern part of New York. And I, man, I had a heck of a day on this fly. I, I didn't change flies the entire day. Um, just through that whole, just through that the entire day. And man, the fish went nuts for it. So I want to show uh, the, the technique that I use to dub this fly and why I do it. So it's kind of, kind of two videos in one here. So in the vise, I've got a, uh, I got a Foling Mill FM50. Uh, these are excellent uh, jig hooks. That's kind of what I've been gravitating towards lately for the bead I got a Hanak three millimeter that's what we're going to be rolling with here for the thread I'm going to use this 18 knot nano silk it's one of my favorite threads that I use for a lot of different flies it's kind of weird that I'm using it for this fly because it's kind of it's kind of unnecessary normally uh, but there's a specific reason why I use it and I'll show you in a minute I might even run out I'll have to change spools probably halfway through this video but I'm going to get it, get that started, and I'm going to just create a dam right behind this bead to get that kind of locked in. You could throw a little bit of weight on there if you want, but i, I got to be honest with you, with a fly this small, I'm not really going to put a lot of weight on there. And it's really just going to kind of be negligible, so I'm just going to build that up with a thread dam and we'll be fine. Once that bead gets secure, it's not moving Yeah, we're good. You can put some glue on there if you want, but that's really kind of unnecessary. I, I know people use a lot of glue, but nine times out of ten, I don't, I don't really think that it's particularly necessary. So, All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to move our thread down a little bit. And the first material that I'm going to tie in is this fluorescent orange glow bright. Really bright stuff. That's what we're going to make the tail out of. You can use floss too. I actually even kind of sometimes even prefer floss, but if you double this globe right up and fold it over, it's just as good. It's just a little bit thinner than the floss. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fold that over, make a little bit of a loop out of it just to double it up. I'm going to put that on the back side. And pull it up so that I can secure that right on the top of the hook shank. So I'm going to hold both of these pieces tight as I bring this all the way down to the bend of the hook. With nice tight touching wraps, I'm going to get that locked in there nicely. And we're good. And to move it back up, I want to save on bulk. Not that that's really that important when you're using this thread because uh, it's just so thin. But I'm just going to kind of aggressively move it back towards the front and we'll get this snipped off okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to pull my thread all the way to me and i'm going to put my finger try to follow what i'm saying i can't really move the camera to show you this but i'm going to put my finger almost all the way down to the base of to my pedestal base for my vice see how my thread is going straight down my finger is almost down to the pedestal vice or the pedestal base. Then I'm going to come back up with my thread. Actually, no, I'm not. I said in the beginning of the video, I'm probably going to run out of thread, and I just did. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my thread up to the very front where I don't have to worry about any bulk. I'm just going to do a little whip finish there to save my work. Get that out of there. I'm going to pause the video, and I'll be back in a minute. All right, back in business. Got a full spool here now. You know, it's kind of funny. I run out of that stuff. I don't even get nervous. I buy so much of this. Every time I put in a fly order, I usually get two or three extra spools of this, so I just always have it laying around. All right, so back to what I was saying. Thread going straight down. I'm going to pull a bunch of thread out of the bobbin, and I'm going to lower my finger almost down to my pedestal vise, come back up, and I'm basically going to make a really long dubbing loop. And as I make my way back down to the tail, 
I'm just going to go down about a fourth of the way and then come back up and I want to make a nice taper because what's going to happen is when I dub this I'm not going to have a lot of control over for, over shaping the body the way that I want because the dubbing is going to kind of be locked in and I'll show you that in a sec. So I want a nice shape to my underbody before I start dubbing. So I'm going to put a nice little taper in here and come back up to the top and we're good. Okay. So here's what I wanted to show you. This is called the rope dub technique. It is a different way to dub a fly and I use it quite a bit. Now the appeal of this is it is the absolute tightest dubbed body you could possibly get. So if you're tying like a hair's ear nymph or something like that, you know, where you want some bugginess and a bunch of strands sticking out, um, it's probably not the technique you're going to want to use for that. This is more for a fly like this. And the reason why I use it on this fly is because I want this fly to get down and get down quick. I want it to just plummet. Um, that Euro nymphing, quick sinking fly stuff, it, it doesn't really doesn't really work well with dubbed flies because that dubbed material um, with all that extra stuff really kind of slows the sink rate down. So by really tightening up the dubbing on this, you can make it sink a lot quicker. So you get a dubbed body Euro nymph out of this, which is really cool. So here's what I'm going to do. I got my dubbing loop here split into two pieces and I'm just going to let the bottom part hang and I've got some brown Australian possum here. And I am going to pull off tiny little wisps of it. I don't even know if you can see that on the camera, but I'm talking tiny, tiny, tiny little wisps. I don't know if you can hear that on the camera, but we are getting some ripping winds here. And that might be showing up in the background. I apologize for that. But a day like that, freezing cold with ripping winds, that's why I'm inside tying flies. So... So I am just going to really, really lightly dub that noodle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it uniform. If you, if you hit a little spot where it's not uniform and it's, you know, you got some clumps in it, don't be afraid to take it out, redo it. But the biggest thing is, is however much dubbing you think is enough, cut it probably in half. And do even less. I, I mean, I'm talking like just minimal dubbing. You don't want a lot of that buggy material on here. Because remember, the name of the game is sink rate. You want this fly to get down. It's got a bead on it, which is good. That's going to add some nice weight. But, you know, there's no lead underbody or anything like that. So anything you do to it that might slow the sink rate is going to kind of affect how this is going to perform. So... Nice thin noodle, and you're going to need a long dubbing loop too. Remember I said that I brought my thread almost down to my pedestal base? Because you're definitely going to need a long noodle. Almost done. Probably could have paused the recording while I did this, but there was some stuff I wanted to explain while I did it, so here we are. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my dubbing twister. I like this, uh, I never know how to say it, that smayan or whatever. Now, out of the two pieces of this dubbing loop, there's, there's only dubbing on one. You see that one part of the loop is dubbed and the other part isn't? So what's going to happen is when I spin this, that thin thread is going to wrap into the dubbing and lock it in to the point where it's just going to be absolutely rock solid. But the other cool thing about it is the thread is basically going to disappear into the dubbing. So it's just all going to be completely locked in. You're not going to see the thread. And, it, and the reason why it's called the rope dub technique is because it definitely forms uh, some segmented pieces that kind of look like a rope. So right now I've got the, the tool spinning and you can kind of see that start to take shape takes a lot of turns so if you don't have one of these tools you're just going to have to do it by hand and it's going to take a hell of a lot of twists this tool is pretty cool because you just spin it and just kind of let it go all right 
That looks like what we're looking for. All right. Now, what I would normally do is I would use my rotary feature, but I don't have a way to secure my bobbin. Or Can I get this around? Yeah, that'll work. I wasn't going to do that because uh, when I circle the bobbin, or the bobbin holder around, it usually gets in the way of the camera. So I'm going to put one hitch into here. And I'm going to hang my bobbin off the front. Get that out of the way. All right, so I'm going to start spinning this. Get that out of the way for the back. All you want to do is just go forward with touching wraps. And you'll see that that dubbing is going to go on there very, very tightly. There's not going to be a whole lot of material splaying out. And, you know, I know you might think, you know, I, on a nymph, you, you want that buggy look. And I agree with you, and you definitely do. But you're going to get the buggy look from the collar. All right, so there's that. Nicely tapered. Get that out of the way. Secure it. All right. All right, so that's our body. And as I said before, it's a, it's a really cool way to do a body because it's dubbed, but that dubbing is just locked into that thread so tightly that it's it's really hard to uh, to to see anything you know kind of sticking out or anything or anything that might affect the sink rate. Um, that's definitely wrapped on there very tightly, and that fly is definitely going to plummet. So I want a little bit of a tag tail coming off the back. So I'm going to snip that, and I'm going to make another really small dubbing loop here at the head. I'm just going to wrap that around a couple times, get that locked in. All right, and in this loop, what I'm going to want to do is put some natural hair's ear in there. And I don't want a lot because remember, I, I want this fly to sink and I want it to sink pretty quickly. So I don't really want to load it up with a lot of dubbing. So I just want to put us in a position where you know, you've got enough bugginess to get the look that you're kind of looking for, but you're not really making it so that the fly doesn't sink. So I'm just going to take a little tuft of hair. Not hair, hair, rabbit. Just a little bit, because if you look how small this fly is, we're really only going to be making a turn or two with this, so you don't really need a ton. So I'm going to get that. I want as many of those guard hairs to be in this loop as possible. And even though I said you don't need a lot of this, you want to make sure that you put enough in so that when you spin it, it goes all the way around. You could always not use all of it if you want, but if you don't put enough, then you're kind of screwed. So that looks about good. So I'm going to give this a good spin. Get that all locked in. Take a little brush, get some of that extra out of there. You want this nice and sparse. You don't want a ton of material. You just want a nice buggy looking collar. Which it looks like we're going to get. All right, I'm going to transfer this over to my hackle pliers and give it a give it one turn. I'm going to pull everything back so that it splays towards the back of the fly. Give that one wrap. And that's looking about good right there. You don't really want a ton. So I'll get that locked in nice and tight. this, pull that back a little, all right, so let's get the thin thread out of there, this is traditionally tied with a little bit of a hot spot, so I'm going to whip finish this thread just to get that sealed up, 
And then I'm going to transfer over to a different bobbin here with some fluorescent orange UTC-70. And I'm not really going to do much with this. I'm just going to slip this in behind the bead. Wrap that around. Get rid of the excess. And all we're going to do is stroke that back a little bit. One, two, three. Whip finish on that. And that's good. I was going to do another whip finish, but that'll work just fine. So there you have it. That is a blowtorch, which is a very popular fly. I'm, I'm sure most people are probably at least somewhat aware of it. I've known of it. I fished it a few times, but it's never really been anything crazy for me. But like I said, I took a trip where that was the primary fly we used. It's super simple to tie. Very, very easy. And man, did we just hammer fish all day on that. We didn't have one of those days where, you know, we're changing flies left and right. It was just blowtorch all day long. Uh, so it's a really cool fly. It's it's I've, I've changed my tune on it. Um, I started loaded up my box with it this coming year. I'm going to be using it in a lot of different areas. Um, so it's a fly that I've definitely come to know and love after a hell of a trip. So any questions or anything, just throw them in the comments. Um, but other than that, tie a few up. These are really easy to tie and really, really effective.